Hi all. Barnet Chess Club had an away match for their first team in the North Circular League. We were playing against Ilford away and I was the driver to get four of our players there. It was a bit of a mad ra rush and um, we nearly went the wrong way so ending up defaulted but uh, no, we, we managed to just about get there uh, with a 15 minute um, clock advantage given to them. They had started promptly at 7.30. So playing black, I was playing against John Hodgson, who I've lost to before with black, and funny enough in the French defence. So I'd, I thought I'd repeat at least my first move, the French, which is generally quite solid and reliable. And after d4, d5, he played knight d2, the Tarash variation. And I thought, do I want to repeat the previous game where I played knight f6, or shall I try and surprise him in the opening and try and get back some of my uh, 15 minutes that, that I was, um, he had the advantage on the clock. So I, I decided to use one of um, I am John Watson's dangerous weapons in the French ideas. I played knight c6 and also I used to play this um, even before the Watson book in Blitz because the idea is to try and encourage White to play later at e5 and undermine White's pawn chain and its head of the chain, which is the e5 pawn, not at its base, which is like um, you know either c5 or d4. So basically, it's a provocative move. And after knight g3, I do play knight f6, and he plays e5. So the knight goes back to d7. I did though just to check I had the right position. Consider bishop, consider knight e4 here. Um, knight e4, Ribka thinks white's better with just bishop d3. If f5 yeah, I don't think this is that hot, uh, this kind of position. Slight advantage to white. But it doesn't seem too disastrous. Anyway, so anyway, after e5, knight to d7. And now after bishop e2, which I thought was a little bit more passive than bishop d3, I played f6. So I'm attacking that pawn chain at the head of the chain, the e5 pawn. He took on f6, I took my queen. And usually, you know, I look forward to this kind of position if I can play bishop d6, castles and later e5 because you know as well as f fold pressure you know maybe h2 in this diagonal is, is going to be dangerous for white later but he has a particular idea in mind um, he wants to stop this liberating e5 move and he does something which is recommended in Watson's book this knight maneuver knight f1 so the idea is to play knight e3 from knight and when knight is on e3, then e5 will be totally discouraged by black later because of that pressure on d5. Not only that, knight threatens some vari variations to go to g4. It also supports c4. So it's got a number of advantages. But there is a slight disadvantage, I think. It you know it blocks in that, that queen's bishop. You know, maybe you know white will be passive if black um, plays his cards right. So I played bishop d6 anyway. And um, he plays knight e3. And here I castle, and um, he castles. And I remember, you know, preparing this line for, for last year's British Championship. And I wondered about this position. If black's not getting in e5, what does black do here, strategically? And I did find some games on chess live D, which I was kind kind of impressed with. Um, one of the strong players um, was actually not trying to wriggle the bishop. Uh, you know, with this route, which would take a long time, especially because that knight's in the way, but actually just finchetting the queen's bishop, and later moving this knight away, and then preparing c5. Pardon me. So I thought that was an interesting plan. So I played b6, and after c3, bishop b7. And I had this sense, you know, I liked the aesthetic look of my position, that at least, you know, in this game, I'm, I'm really actively trying to do something with this bishop. Um, as it turned out, he, you know, he could have kept this bishop in a, in a sort of virtual prison, you know, behind this d5 pawn. And, um, you know, as we'll see in the game, the bishop was was a hero, but maybe it shouldn't have been. So um, he plays bishop d3. And by the way, the thing I'd like to give this game is um, basically you don't always have to run faster than the bear. And let me explain before I start getting into my move blunders. So far, I think Ribka was okay with my moves. There's this little joke, uh, well, which is not so funny for one of the victims. But say you're with someone else, and there's this huge bear which can run very fast. Um, now, 
do you accept that you're both going to be eaten? It's a hungry bear. It's 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 after some dinner, or um, do you put on your running shoes? Well, in the joke, the person puts on their running shoes, and the other person asks, "Well, you know, why bother? Uh, you can't outrun the bear." And the, the person's reply is, "I'm not. I don't want to outrun the bear. I just want to outrun you." <laughs> and and I, I'm reminded of this because in this game, you know, there are a lot of errors. Actually, both sides. Um, um, actually more on my side but these errors you know they're sometimes not picked up in over the board chess it's only in post-mortem with Ribka and it's as if you know when you're playing over the board I think you have to accept that that you're not trying to play perfect chess like a computer you can't outrun the computer which is like the bear all you can do is is outrun your opponents so you, you know every move every last move you make kind of causes concern sometimes to the opponent it might not be a perfect move though if the opponent was totally objective, uh, you know, they would do all sorts of things which, you know, we're currently, you know, we're limited by our emotions, our, our emotional reaction to, to moves, etc. And here, I think I caused my first emotional reaction on the opponent by annoying him uh, to prevent the use of this knight coming to g4 to e5. I played something quite radical. I wonder if you can guess it. Um, if I give you um, five seconds to find quite a radical solution to this possibility, this positional possibility of clamping down on my backward pawn on that semi-open file. So I didn't really want to be concerned with knight g4. So five seconds starting from now. Okay, I played the crazy move h5, seemingly weakening my king. And, um, yeah, Ribka thinks, you know, why it's better here. And, um, Gives, gives the opponent's move as the third candidate at the moment, about depth 11, or second candidate now. So it's a strong move my opponent played in reply. He clamped down on the g5 square. He played h4. Anyway, so I'm faced you know, with potential possibilities here of white actually retreating this knight there and then using that g5 square, e.g. bishop g5. And I thought also, you know, as well as knight g5, he'll be attacking my h5 pawn with, with, with his queen. So I wanted to solve some of the problems here. And now I play just g6. So not only it, you know, it anticipates a threat on the h pawn, it gives my queen a route back here if needed, so g7 or even h8, which was useful in one variation that we might explore later. Um, and he plays actually knight g5. So now I notice this f5 square is kind of cute to use. It's on my semi-open file. It's a natural, maybe, outpost square. So I play the natural looking knight e7, which also now supports c5, which exploits the kind of passive bishop and, and generally this knight, which wasn't really designed to support d4. Um, and here, in this position, it seems, according to Ribka, that black is almost equal, 0.06. So it wasn't completely outraged by this structure here, that there is some dynamic compensation for black. He clamps down on my e5 square, though, by playing f4, slightly weakening his king in the process, though. And it's here that, you know, um, if, if we were, if I was playing a bear, you know, a supercomputer, Ribka, then although I've naturally played the move knight to e7, with the plan of knight f5, I think the stronger the opponent you play, the more you must just look at the position cold. You know, like Spock. I mean, that's you know a lot. Of what Kotov is about is about this cold analysis. I play knight e7 with the expectation I'll be able to play knight f5, hitting his pawn. So I had that you know emotional attachment to that idea. But Ribka hates this idea, knight f5, or at least it did last night. But on this machine, it's actually suggesting it. Um, I, I had the impression last night c5 was better. Or, or maybe it's just the strength of my opponent's reply. Anyway, so knight f5. And the opponent maybe played a deeper move than he had thought. He'd actually told me he miscalculated this, this continuation, where his knight on g5 would be loose. He plays the move g4, which I think maybe if we give Ribka enough time, it might end up playing g4 dynamically sacrificing the h4 pawn.